but Phil Donahue was the guy who, who pioneered this entire format, this, this idea of talk during the daytime. Because you have to remember, daytime TV up until that point had been old black and white movies, uh, soap operas, of course, and, and game shows. As the 70s came in, the, the daytime game show appeared. But there really wasn't anyone talking because nobody really felt that that audience meant anything. Nobody thought, and think about how stupid, what a male chauvinist world we had then. The thinking was, the daytime hours are garbage, because it's nothing but women anyway, and we're really only interested in selling Buicks to the men, so let's get some soap companies, and let's create some stupid dramas that the dumb little housewives will be interested in, and that's why they're called soaps. That's why they're called soap operas, because it was a way for the television executives to sort of figure out a small way to make some money off that useless population they had during the day, the unemployed children and women. They so, weren't interested. So, so, oh. so Phil Donahue comes along, and he does this, this whole complete radicalization of the format. He actually has intelligent talk with people. I, mean, I have to tell you, as a, as a child growing up, I was introduced at 10 years old to the likes of Anne Rand, Louis Farrakhan, David Duke. Uh, my God, I even remember seeing a, a, an interview with Johnny Carson recently on YouTube that was just spectacular. So to Cole Tibbetts, who just thinks that daytime television has always been chairs being thrown, noses being broken, we remember a time when it was actually quite different. We remember a time before the likes of a Phil Donahue, who was... Introduced intelligence. I'm telling you, man, I, could you imagine in this day and age, an hour-long interview, a serious interview, with a Rand or a Farrakhan or something in the middle of the day? Rich Hancock is here. Hi, Rich. How are you? How are you, brother? Thank you so much for this. How are things over at the library? Uh, we're getting ready for the uh, for the people's response to the uh, Bush um, library dedication. So, yeah, we're, we're doing good. All right, very good. Now, and, of course, the film, uh, which uh, uh, Phil Donahue was going to be talking about tonight at the Angelica Theater. I was going to do a whole intro. I was oh. going to pretend he wasn't here yet. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I screwed mind, it up. And I screwed it up. And, and we're, but we've got lots of exciting things happening, not yeah. the least of which being... Mr. Phil Donahue, a television icon, an absolute treasure, and a guy who should be doing a podcast or a radio show. Or a, I, Phil, thank you so much for coming here. Let me just say, you have no idea what this means to us. The people who do this kind of... Look, I, I worked in corporate radio in this town for 10 years and for 10 years before that in Chicago. This, owning our product, doing what we want, not being under the thumb of... of, of corporate pressures or whatever you showing up and actually taking the time out of your day and not going to a BAP or some Rush Limbaugh station thank you so much for this Phil Donahue ladies and gentlemen pleasure uh, first things first I love your sweatshirt I knew you would <laughs> I knew you would <laughs> um, have you told your listeners your, your uh, they know I'm, I'm a diehard Notre Dame freak and, I, and I've, I've told the people here that you know they know that this is, do I wear this, what, every other day? This is my, it's a little chilly outside. <laughs> and, and I believe, I, I also, I think, I think I'm wearing my green white socks hat. Is it the one with the clover? It's actually the blue one. Oh, it's the blue one. Okay, see, I don't even know. I don't even know. But uh, yeah, die, hey, look, Irish Catholic kid from the south side of Chicago. Die hard Notre Dame. Didn't really have the opportunity to go because I may have partied a little bit too much in high school. But uh, yes, the, uh, one, of our, one of our favorite Notre Dame graduates. Lou Holt used you. to say... Uh, our former coach, Lou Holtz, used to say, an atheist is a man who doesn't care whether Notre Dame wins or loses. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we know how to swagger. I'm glad we're here. Thank you for the invite. Thank you for being here, truthfully. Uh, thank you for all the nice words. I was afraid you wouldn't be able to read my handwriting. Well, 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 I, 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 Mr. Donnie, you didn't hear this because I was talking about this uh, uh, coming up, but I, I am born and raised in the south side of Chicago. Uh, I grew up, born in 1969, so you know I was 10 years old in 1979 when my mom was cleaning up and I was running around in the living room, and you were on in our living room. And, and you, you, to me, to an Irish Catholic kid, first of all, my grandma used to say, uh, he, he, he did good. He's one of us that did good. You know, the Irish Catholic kid comes out of the Midwest, now you're a big national TV star. For me, for my narrative, and I've been doing this for 20 years on radio, 
Uh, I tell people that like my voice, my communication, my style is based on four people. And those four people are from a radio background. It's Steve Dahl in Chicago, who, who really sort of showed me what talk radio could be. Uh, Mike Royko, who was a legendary columnist in, in Chicago. Uh, and then two people, Tom Schneider and Phil Donahue. And, and I still catch myself in some of my rants <clears throat> going into your style. <laughs> it's wow. like, I know, I know that that's you coming through me. So thank you for that. Well, Mike, Ro- Mike Royko was a, f- a real idol of mine as well. I was awed by this guy. I came to Chicago from Dayton, Ohio, where we had two newspapers, but they were owned by the same Cox, uh, large company. And I got to Chicago, and Royko's columns just blew me away. I mean, he would, he would name the street corner. Yeah. He'd name the cop. <laughs> he'd <laughs> yeah. name the woman who was pushed around. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, what, you know, if the cop looked down her blouse, he said, you know, it was he in the cop. He picked fights with judges. <laughs> <laughs> he really? openly really. And the mayor. Yeah. Oh, yeah. D-A-M-A-R-E. Oh, sure. sure. Mayor. Uh, Daly. Daly. So, uh, he, Ryko used to say, um, foreign-born cab drivers in Chicago have no idea where they're going. And they think the best way to get there is fast. <laughs> he was well, he had all of those. Yeah. I mean, Phil, he didn't he fabulous. also say of the uh, when when the Sun Times was bought by the by the Murdoch Corporation? He said, "The uh, Chicago Sun Times, I wouldn't work there because no self respecting fish would want to be wrapped in it." It, it was actually <laughs> the Tribune when they. Well, I believe he, it was Ru- no, he, it was the Sun Times. He, he, he it was, was the Sun Times. Yeah. yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah. Because now it's the Tribune now that Rupert is interested mm. in. He's uh, he's looking at the Tribune in Chicago. Oh, actually, isn't it the Koch brothers who are interested in, in the Tribune? You're Probably. right, it is. That's, yeah. that's you're right, a, it is. I knew it was one of your I'm sorry. I was just a little, I'm nervous. Come on. Now. I'm Give sorry, brother. I, listen, I've been happen. nervous all day. We're hanging with, I, I, I said to Phil when we were doing a thing earlier this morning, watching him and listening to him just convey what he conveys is like watching Ted Williams hit a baseball. Yeah, is that lost on you? I mean, it, you seem, you've always been such an unaffected guy. You've always come off as humble and really wearing your emotions. <laughs> on the sleeve is it lost on you that we spent hours scrubbing this place <laughs> we spent, I mean, do you realize that when, when you meet people on the street because you're highly recognizable well i got a lot of breaks uh i mean i got breaks as a teenager you know i'm thinking of kids today i worked in a steel mill yeah that's not possible today yeah. i went on strike with the united steel workers of america this was canton ohio republic steel I mean, I would play euchre with the, the, you know, the older guys, and I learned so much, you know. I saw the open hearth flame in their faces, you know, and the sweat. Well, I you lo- don't get that now. Well, you can't. Where would a kid get a job in a steel mill exactly. today? Exactly. Right. I worked in a florist shop. I can make a corsage, and I'd be happy well, to do it for you uh, if you, well. <laughs> 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 hey, um, people think that's easy. That's not easy. Mm. But, uh, but, I mean, isn't it, when I look back on it, I didn't realize how fortunate I was. And I was standing there when two-way radio, you know, you call in and you yell at the Fight City Hall and so on. That was very new in 19, and this is the mid-60s. I don't even know what that is. I'm sorry. I, that, that doesn't sound, what is, what is that? Well, two-way this way format, radio? talking to people oh. when they call <laughs> in on the show. <laughs> okay, all right, I thought. In, in, was it in Daytonville? In, in, yeah, in, 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 yeah. Yeah, you did. Now, you did one of the first call-in shows, right? I mean, nobody well, had really on, done that. I, I did it on radio first. Yeah. And then I was asked to come over to the TV by the general manager who was listening to me on the way to lunch or whatever it was. And I said, how are we going to, what are we going to show when the caller's on the air? Well, he didn't care about <laughs> that. And off we went. And uh, that was 1967. And then when did when did the show take off? When did you come to... You know, actually, going back for a minute, you talked about Royko, and and this is something I want. Well, that was an inspiration. I mean, with him in my he, background, he, he had he, the way that he just wasn't afraid to say what was really going on. There wasn't any sugarcoating. Amazing. We have. Do you think? And I know newspapers are dead, and, and and blogs are marginalized by most people at best. I mean, will we ever have that kind of a rock star writer again like a daily like Royko in Chicago in the 70s I was just a kid but you were there he was a rock star he could walk he would buy a drink for 20 years in that I time. agree I, I mean agree. do you think that exists or will that exist or where do those influences those social voices where do they come from now well now <clears throat> they've morphed into shock jocks 
who, uh, yeah. you know, talk about, you know, hoes, use H-O to refer to a black <laughs> female. And, uh, Imus you know, uh, well, <laughs> yeah. good old Imus. Um, I don't know. I, I, we, you're right, though. I hadn't thought about that. We don't have a, a Royko. We've got Newspapers. too many disparate voices. Well, it's, it's hard to find. Right. That's why you're, you're in the right place here. You're not beholden to a, you know, large corporations don't want to rock the boat because they are the boat. <clears throat> and they don't want to push back on establishment power. It's not popular to do that. People don't like scolds. Scolds don't love America. Scolds are always complaining. Uh, scolds aren't patriotic. It just goes on and on. The effort to marginalize the dissenting voice is huge. I mean, they will, you know, and we're saying, hey, I thought we had free speech in this country. You know, if we can't speak out at controversial times, like when we're going to war, yeah. then, you know, how can you support the First Amendment? I mean, you, you don't have to have it. You can have any kind of country you want. We'll elect a, a neo Mussolini and he'll tell us what's good for us and what we can say out loud. You know, it's so far away from the vision of the framers, which progressives support. You know, if you put the... Uh, is, that, is that what we are now? Because I know liberal is a bad word. Uh, progressive? Well, that's another... Is that what we're going Isn't that an interesting is point? It? We're so ashamed of ourselves that we... I mean, they've so marginalized us yeah. that a liberal has become the political idea that dare not speak its name. How, how is it that we... we and, and I've always been a very progressive-leaning person. I mean, I, I guess I would describe myself as, as moderate, but, you know, to, to liberals... To, to real heavy liberals, I'm a right-wing fascist, and to right-wing Republicans, I'm a liberal lefty, because there are a lot of issues that, for me, don't fit into one category. You know, I, I might be a little Republican on something, and I might be a little... For instance, all of the social issues. I All the social issues and any issues that deal with war, I'm a liberal, and, and I get marginalized that way. But how is it that we are... The liberal media, yet I can't find anyone but John Stewart. I mean, what happened to you when you were a leading liberal voice on MSNBC 10 years ago? Tell people what happened to you. What's up? Because the, the light of history is certainly shining you to be an angel right now. Tell people this story. Well, I was against the Iraq war, and I said so. The only one. Well, I, I, you know, maybe so. Um, Let's remember that every major metropolitan newspaper in this country supported the Iraq war. Yeah. Only 23 senators voted no. 23 senators voted no. And they were pilloried. And, and who, who was our Republican, though? Was it Lincoln Chaffee? Yes, is, it that, was. is that our one guy that Lord voted Island. against? Yep. And he lost his job. Yeah. yeah he was voted out. Um, you could be against the war if you were funny. <laughs> uh, John Stewart. Yeah. Imus was against the war. Bill Maher. Bill yeah. Maher. Bill Maher said it all. He said, they don't hate us for our freedom. They hate us because we're dropping bombs on their houses. Um, uh, Bill uh, Moyers got roughed around at PBS. Yep. You know, PBS <laughs> did not want anybody rumbling against the president at the time. I, you just, it's, I worked for a company that was owned by General Electric. Well, the Defense Department. And Microsoft. <laughs> Uh, Two major of, defense contractors, right? Absolutely so. Yeah. So, and, and you can assume that most of the members of the board are Republican. And believe me, they knew that they had this has-been talk show host on the air who was criticizing our de Secretary of Defense. And they just don't want any part of that, especially when the rest of the media is, as, an, as a memo, which was published by the New York Times, a memo from a consulting group said Donahue's voice is not going to do it against the flag waving on the other station. So you have to shut up and salute when the president is calling a war. And we are t arguing that if we have to, we are saying don't shush Rush, don't shush us. And if we have to, if we have to shut up and sing while a president is, well, when is dissent more important than that? And if we can't do it, stop sending all these Americans who already went to war to, and died, many of them, to protect our way of life, at the center of which is free speech. Come on. We're the patriots. We believe in the—if you put the 
Bill of Rights to us, it would pass. You can't say that now. We're listening in on phone calls without judicial authorization. We're killing people in other countries who are targeted yeah. by the president who is making these decisions in private. What is American to you? We've got people in cages, no phone calls, no nothing, no visitors. And you, you were saying this 10 years ago when, I mean, everybody else was saber rattling. Everybody, the, the, your neighbor next door, oh, we're going to get that Saddam, you know, he harbors terrorists. <clears throat> there was so much misinformation going around. And, and you, if I remember correctly, you were the only thing that people were watching on MSNBC at that time. You, you were the highest rated show on that network. And because you were the only person that wasn't falling in line and saying, hey, hey, we need to look at this about this war, they let you go. Well, it's an interesting study. And uh, the management was actually fearful. And uh, that's not an over, that's not an exaggeration. We had to have, they got so panicked. We had to have two conservatives on for every liberal. I, honestly. <laughs> Why? Because you were considered like a super I liberal? Was considered, I was considered two liberals. Uh, yeah, well, and I'll, okay, I'll, so. sign, I'll sign an autograph for you before I leave. <laughs> um, we could have Richard Pearl on alone, but we couldn't have Dennis Kucinich on alone. Um, I mean, it's just, if you have to but, go but, back But it's a to, liberal media. But how did this lie get out there? That's but amazing. it's a liberal media. Isn't that amazing? I, I've done high-rated radio shows in this town for 10 years, and I cannot get a job because, one, I don't want to talk sports because that's the only thing that you're able to talk about, and, two, I refuse to pretend to be a conservative. I have had program directors tell me, you know, the guys who run the liberal media, these program directors have told me, can't you fake it? Do you remember when I was up for that job a number of years ago and I came to you and I said, look, I might go in undercover. I might take this job and be a phony, crazy conservative. Remember that plan? We were going to set it up at the radio <laughs> station where we were working together. We were going to set up uh, Pugs as a conservative and my being the liberal that I am, my tearing into him for having no soul and whatnot. And we're going to use that to get him a job so he could get in, <laughs> infiltrate the beast, and then come out and say, hey, guess what, guys? And, you know, and one day, Phil, I had this dream, one day to have this big Rush Limbaugh, Glenn Beck type audience, and I would just say, I'm lying to you! <laughs> and you believed it! But I, I can't sleep at my night... At night, even pretending to be someone who doesn't think that that gays are are as equal as the rest of us, or someone who who thinks that maybe we ought to consider who and when we drop bombs more carefully, I can't pretend right. to be something else. And so I'm here, and Jedi's here, and we're doing this, and we've got the most listened to daily podcast in Dallas, and we ain't making any money, but we all know someday we will, because this is the future. I agree with that. And, but there is no place for us. So this bullshit, excuse me, one of the other good things about <laughs> on the internet, this bullshit about a liberal media is a massive lie. It's a, you know why it's a lie? Because the actual media has been saying it. And the actual media is a conservative media. But we're all listening to that and we're ingesting this and we hear liberal media from conservative people on the media. Phil, why are we so stupid? Well, Rich and I were. <laughs> why are we so stupid? <laughs> and this is Jedi, is it? It is, yeah. yeah. Hey, you look like trouble to me. Oh, <laughs> why is uh, that? Uh, you know, I mean, another gorilla, right? Absolutely. Uh, uh, working on the uh, working on the unpopular issues. My hat's off to you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, we were, we were sitting in with our old friend Mark Davis this morning, and 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 Phil and I were talking about the fact that you know this is a guy. And I've told you this a, a thousand times, Pugs. Mark, Mark Davis, Davis is a great guy. My He's a friend. Nice man. Love him to pieces. But there is such a, a, a disconnect that Phil and I were talking about has more to do with <clears throat> his ability to make a living, to put food on the table for his family, and willingness to just say, well, you know, I, I, I believe in the Iraq war completely. It was all good causes, all good reasons. George W. Bush kept us safe, yada, yada, yada. The usual line. Because you've got to do that. You've got to, it's called rational choice theory. You've got to be able to say, I do this because this makes that part of life better, so I'm, gonna, I'm willing to disconnect my, my is, emotional attachment is, to something. Is Mark Davis, do I have this wrong? And, uh, I'm sorry, Phil. We'll get back to you in a minute. <laughs> Phil, Phil Donahue's with Oh, I'm still in <laughs> Phil, Phil, Phil Donahue's thunder. Jeez, I can't do that. Is Mark Davis, and, I, and I, you know I was on opposite him. For about a decade. Yes. So I, I never actually got to listen to his show. Uh -huh. I, mean, I do know stories about him. I know he's a good guy. But is he is he a Bible-based conservative? I mean, where is he on the social issues? Because I, 
I know I always say whenever his name comes up, I always go, oh, Mark Davis is a wonderful guy. We were fierce competitors for years and years. He's a wonderful guy. But I don't know. Is he okay with gays? Is he okay with... I'll give you an example. You remember okay. our good friend Rick Vanderslice. Sure. Broadcaster, legendary Le- broadcaster legendary in Dallas. Legendary homosexual broadcaster. Yes, gay broadcaster yeah. in Dallas. I was doing Inside Texas Politics with Mark Davis on WFAA. Rick said, uh, Rick said to me, could you see if, if, if Mark would be willing to come in and do, uh, do a show with me, just have a conversation with me, and uh, uh, see, ask him, I, I won't be offended if you won't. Mark said, absolutely, drop of the hat, because it, was, it you know, wasn't competing with him. He came in, did two hours with Rick Vanderslice, where they talked about things like gay marriage, and no, Mark, I love everybody, I, I, don't, I, I don't begrudge yeah, but the, you. But then marriage. how does he do a show... You know what I mean? He does. I, I, does he ever address those issues? And well, yeah, he doesn't. He doesn't see where he is astray. He doesn't see that when the Fourteenth Amendment says equal protection under the law for all citizens, gay people are citizens. Oh, but what about bestiality and and incest and 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 and, and polygamy? That's the idiotic. difference between homosexuality yeah. and all those things is. Bestiality, polygamy, uh, uh, incest are crimes. <laughs> and homosexuality is not a crime. In fact, Lawrence versus Texas, 2003, put an end to the last sodomy laws that made the act of homosexuality illegal. They're gone by from constitution. This, uh, t- uh, from this state, Lawrence v. Texas. Yes, exactly. So, but didn't, didn't Mississippi just make it okay like last week? Mississippi didn't. They can't. They, 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 they're no, they in did, violation of the Constitution. They did something there recently. And that'll just get that to was, a, a federal court and it'll get thrown out. Yeah. That's, they, they, they keep on making new abortion laws that are violations of Roe v. Wade. That it's just, it's, it's, it's colored bubbles. It's colored bubbles for the little right wing jack wagons, the poor, <laughs> sad little bloodthirsty shut ins who are sitting in their truck listening to Rush in the afternoon, who just are desperate for that great America that they once had where. Well, colored know, people kept Phil. their place, and women knew that if they got slapped twice, they'd already been told twice. Phil Donahue, you're, you're, you're a little bit older than me. Tell me about this great America that I, that I hear about. <laughs> Tell me about this 1957 ideal community that we all lived in. That's my graduation year. I, I don't know anything about that, apparently. I, yeah, uh, that's when I worked for Republic Steel. Um, I mean, this know, idea of being able to go back to this fantasy of the good old days is really just a red herring, right? Well, it is. Uh, the post-war years, though, made us think, you know, that we have something special here. We were racist. We certainly <laughs> were homophobic. By the way, the Donahue Show put a, a, a real live homosexual right there on my show in, in November of 1967. That that was before Stonewall. I said yesterday on Facebook that the first homosexual I ever saw was on your show. It was probably a, I was probably seven years old, and it was probably the, the late seventies I mean, or something. Really or amazing. Early 80s. And you know, the I mean, mo- you mothers did all this stuff. Is that lost on you? Okay, just go. I'm just. <laughs> I'm keep people, saying that. people thought their kids would catch it. Yeah. If they watched it. Didn't you hug someone with AIDS, and it caused a stir? Someone was on your show. Well, yeah. It was, it was, a, it was a show about. It wasn't about AIDS, because I remember even being a kid thinking, all right, it's AIDS. It was hemophiliacs. It, that's what it was. It was right. AIDS Ryan and hemophilia. White. I was and Ryan you White, hugged yeah. somebody, and I remember people thinking, Phil, or people were saying, oh, I can't believe Donahue hugged that. Well, The good old days. You know, and then we had a, an interior lineman for the New York Jets come out on my show. Mm-hmm. And we got a f- several of them coming out very shortly, right? Professional I, I, I would love to see the Jackie Robinson of, of homosexuals. Absolutely. I want to see somebody we, we had, go uh, first. A star, though. Yeah. Somebody who's playing. Somebody, uh, Phil, somebody who is a star. And Phil knows yeah. this as well as you guys. Several ex-athletes have come out after they've retired and said that they, they were gay and they played yeah. gay. They never say it while they're involved no, in the game. But that's what we need, right, Phil? We need, we need, you know, certainly Eli Manning, I don't know, but someone of that caliber, a Peyton Manning, a Tom Brady, to mm-hmm. hold the press conference and say, you know what? Don't take my poster off your kids' walls, but I'm a homosexual and I always have been. If Tom Brady's gay, he sucks at it. Actually, he's awful. Actually, he's Giselle Bunchen and and, 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 and d- d- the Moynihan girl and well, would, if you were a gay guy, wouldn't you want to be involved in the high fashion world? He is very good looking. He's very well manscaped. All the is, stereotypes. He, that we, know, 
He's well dressed. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, go ahead, Phil. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Rich and I keep going off on this. Uh, no, I'm listening. <laughs> um, the uh, we were thought of as a safe place to go uh, among the politically active gay community. This is very early 70s, 80s. So we had a lot of gay people on. And I was awarded the first GLAD award, Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation, in like the, na- the late 80s. And I went to the Time Life Hospitality Room in Midtown Manhattan, and I got my plaque. There were probably, I'm saying, 16 people there. Got my picture taken. They called me back on the 25th anniversary of that first award, media award. The event was held in the Marquis Marriott Hotel in in New York City, one of the largest ballrooms in the city. There wasn't an empty seat, wall-to-wall tables. On the wall were uh, logos from Fortune 500 companies, IBM, General Motors, American Airlines, all the way around. The, The red carpet with all the paparazzi, there were more photographers there than there were when I first... It is amazing what has happened to this revolution. Yeah. You know, nobody's going up to a gay guy and saying, hey, I'm, I bet you're glad that's over. It isn't. <laughs> it isn't. It's not over, and homophobia is, is lethal, and we all have a responsibility to step forward. And who would have thunk in 1967 when this, this I never saw moral courage like this. This guy sat across the, stri- across the uh, table from me, and he said, yes, I am. And he looked at the audience and he said, "What's it to you?" And everybody groaned. Oh, right? my, oh, oh, I'm telling you, the uh, you know the buildings fell down. The in, worst in Dayton, thing you Ohio. could be. Yeah. Yep. Well, but, and Phil had Madeline Murray O'Hare back sure. the, the atheist. Yeah. When that was uh, in, you know incredibly controversial. Atheism or atheists to most of America were you know had had bifurcated tails and cloven sure. hoofs and sat around you know uh, they, they were ruining Christmas by making us take down our manger scenes every December. Well, more than that, they Those were they were sacrificing children to the yeah. tree god. They were they were doing something, but. Phil put a face on atheism for this country. Absolutely, yeah. And, and uh, Madeline Murray O'Hare was another one of those people that you introduced me to at a very young age. And the idea, look, I'm, I'm culturally Catholic. I tell people, yeah, I, I like the the circuses. I like, I go to church uh, uh, on Easter and, and for uh, Christmas mass, uh, midnight mass, I should say. And, and I love all of that stuff about my heritage, my Irish Catholic when, heritage. When you look at a woman, do you have an impure thought? Absolutely. Well, <laughs> You're Catholic. So, I'm looking at you, and I'm having You're impure Catholic. thoughts. <laughs> uh, this is, uh, but but how do you how do you balance that? I mean, as I mean, you talked about um, you talked about atheism in a way that had never been talked about before. You opened people's ideas to the thought that hey, maybe this is all crap that we've been taught. I mean, I know that you're Irish Catholic by culture, at least uh, in your upbringing. So. How do you how do you balance that, and how do you not look at religion? I mean, I'm more than a lapsed Catholic. I I don't know. I believe that there's probably something, but I don't think it's written down in a book, and I don't think people are charging to hear about it. I I I, well, I don't know what I am. How do you everything it seems? Well, it is due to religion these days. We did the first show in the early '80s on uh, pedophilia in the Catholic Church. I remember that too. With, with my mother watching from her apartment in Cleveland. Oh my. So. Uh, I wrote a book in 1978, and I concluded it with a lot of questions I had. I, I said that I, you know, I, I went to Notre Dame, a feeling that I knew all the answers. And as the years gone by, I, I realized that I, I was enjoying the questions more. Uh, and I have trouble with original sin. You're not asked to be born, and you're sinful. What? Um, I have trouble with uh, believing that there's a hell for everlasting damnation. I mean, we're not fair to God, really. We've made God an angry person who, you better worship me or I'll show you what trouble really is. I don't think you sink a foul shot if you bless yourself. But What about uh, winning a Grammy? How about winning a Grammy? Does he have anything to do with that? Because... Seems like he does. Well, I used to pray. I prayed a lot. I prayed to, you know, be able to graduate from this university. <laughs> sure. I was scared to death. Um, so it is a big departure, really, from a childhood there that, uh, you know, we had a pope who couldn't make mistakes. 
we were in the one true church. Yeah, I, was, I mean, well, you had two lives. You had pre-Vatican II and then post-Vatican II, so you're and, Catholic. And, right. You're I was schizophrenic. I was in the best religion, and I was the best kind of Catholic. I was an Irish Catholic. Oh, we couldn't be beat. I mean, we swaggered. I was. A, <laughs> we had our own. We had our own holiday, St. Patrick's Day. Absolutely, everybody I, wanted to be us. I marched down Euclid Avenue with. Had my, our own university. Uh, and yeah. A damn good football team. Right. What and, else? And uh, they tell another story. I've got to tell you this. Um, Lou Holtz is standing in the back of the grotto, <laughs> and Joe Paterno comes down. They're playing Penn State tomorrow, and Joe Paterno comes down and he lights a candle and bows his head and prays to the Virgin. And he leaves. And Lou Holtz went up and blew the yes, candle. Yes, he did. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he did. So, <laughs> That's awesome. Um, no, you know, God was on our side. That's another thing. I don't think you can praise the Lord and pass the ammunition. I think those are mutually exclusive ideas. And I, I don't think God is on any one side in a war. Do you uh, believe in God? Do you believe in the Judeo-Christian idea of a guy on a throne up in the clouds who uh, sent his only son? Who's a white guy, by the way, with oh, a yeah. white beard. From the Middle East. The, uh, the uh, Holy Spirit is white, a white bird. Mm -hmm. uh, Jesus was white. You know, you can't come out. All the statues in church were white. I'm with Tennyson on this. Uh, okay. Alfred Lord Tennyson. I roomed with him in, in college. <laughs> oh, another Notre Dame great. Yeah, he was a cornerback, I believe. Here's, here, uh, he was redshirted, though. In this <laughs> unit. Here's, here's what he said in a long poem called The Memoriam, I think, something like that. It's buried in the... Of, of uh, religion, he said, There lives more faith in honest doubt, believe me, than in half the creeds. And I read that and I thought, oh my goodness, you're speaking for me. I don't think, it's hard to believe this is an accident. You know, you look up there and you see all those, and they're going around in circles and the galaxies. And uh, an accident? It's hard to. So you don't know. So your answer, you're dancing I, around, you're being very I'm, eloquent. Uh, Do you believe I don't in know. God, the Judeo-Christian? I'm agnostic. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, that's what I have to say too. I don't know. And I think a lot of atheists are as messianic. As the oh. Christians, you know, and I used to tell Madeline Murray, I said, you cannot absolutely say there is no God and then laugh at somebody who says he's absolutely certain there is, you know, right. open your heart here. Maybe, you know, they have a right. And so do you. This is America. That's why we have so many churches. It's the separation of church I, and I'm state. I'm just uncomfortable when my, well, who is no longer my God, but who I guess I was baptized into his army. I, I have a real problem when. He is used to subjugate, marginalize, or somehow tell other people who don't have this faith that they're not as good as me. Imagine. I can't. Could you imagine Jesus saying, no, you two gay guys can't get married? What Jesus would have been a homophobe? And, Oops, Jesus is a homophobe. <laughs> and the Catholic Church continues to preach that doctrine. Yeah. Um, you know, if, um, if a child is born and not baptized... Uh, and gets killed by a tsunami. We used to believe that that child couldn't go to heaven. We invented purgatory, where we sent this child. If you're a because that was easier to digest, to digest. Uh, yeah, because a grieving mother couldn't handle it. So they came up with something conveniently that would you know, right. make the mother feel. If better. a serial killer goes on death row and repents and tells Jesus that he's eternally sorry for having done, and gets blessed by a priest who throws holy water on him. He gets a chicken fried dinner before he's executed. <laughs> and he goes to heaven. I mean, this is, this is the dogma. Mm. Sam Harris is making this point. Uh, he, he's, he spoke at Notre Dame, by the way. He said, if you get up in the morning and you sh say a few Latin words over a cracker and you s claim that that cracker is Elvis Presley, you're a lunatic. If a priest gets up in the morning and says the same words over a wafer and says, that's Jesus, yes. you're Catholic. Yeah. And, of course, you know, he, I mean, this is pretty it's rough. It's a club we belong to. And it's, we also, by the way, we have to respect the people who believe. I, I don't think it's, it's not, you know, my faith and my education at Notre Dame, if it taught me anything, it taught me to be tolerant and 
and I, you know, I used to pray a lot. I was a very good Catholic. And it's hard to make these points because you know you're offending, you're hurting a lot of very devout people, many of whom are my close friends who go to Mass every, <clears throat> every Sunday. But boy, the church is in as much trouble as ever. And when I graduated from Notre Dame in 1957, 75% of Catholics went to church regularly on Sunday, including the Donahues. In that, today, 25%. How about Catholic your kids? You, you have grown children. Uh, are, are they Catholic? Do they practice? I, I, I have a four-year-old child, a uh, little boy, and I, I didn't even have him baptized. Uh, my kids do not go to church. That's what's, And that is what's happened to the Catholic Church. The, From your generation to their generation. Right. While the Pharisees are up on the altar saying, I'm here, God. I, I worship you, God. I am a good person, God. The door to the church behind them is open. And young people are fleeing for life. Can we do a little bit of business while we got Phil here? Phil's in yeah, town absolutely. for Do you need to go? Very important. Do we reason. need to get you out of here, or can we take a break and do another mm-hmm. segment? I should be. Uh, we got a we got a do narrow go? time window. We right, do no have problem. to go. Let's let's keep going. Yeah, let's talk about. I'm sorry, you, you were in town. You, you obviously have. Uh, some big stuff going on. Tell us what's happening. The film is called Body of War. Phil is a uh, producer of uh, the uh, Body of War. It's a story of Tom Young, who was a, a, a veteran, a military veteran, who was injured, m- just to horribly injured in s- defense of his country. The film is at the Angelica Theater down here on Mockingbird Lane tonight okay. at 7:45. Uh, Phil will be there for a Q and A after the program. Tom will be with us via Skype from Kansas City. So that's all happening tonight at 7:45 at the Angelica Theater. Uh, call the Angelica this is the Angelica questions. on Mockingbird. Yes, on Mockingbird Lane. Okay, and it's tonight at what time? Tonight at seven forty-five. So it, if you can make it, uh, it's tickets are going fast. Okay, uh, Phil, I we're gonna we're gonna let you go. We uh, we'll be promoting that throughout the show as well. So we uh, thank you so much for being here. Pleasure. And uh, I, uh, I I didn't get to talk to you about Oprah. Boy, that woman just loves you. Uh, quickly, wow. you get a quick Oprah story. I mean, how was your relationship? Were you guys in Chicago at the same time? Or no, she... I had left. I had left. I was in New York at the time. Oprah has risen to a level in our business unknown to all of us. Says she owes it all to you. Well. Not once. She said that a million times. Well, she's been good to me, and I have been very positive in my comments about her. It's hard to argue, really, with her success. Man, she was and remains fabulous. What happened to the format? Lastly, what happened to that? What I mean, do you look at what the Jerry Springer's of the world or the Steve Wilkos? Well, you know, do, is that do you even recognize that? <laughs> we used to have male strippers. I brought I, you male had a strippers. grown man in a diaper once. I remember <laughs> seeing that <laughs> some baby thing. So yeah, you are you are not without sin. I have but interviewed. you also had Farrakhan. You also had you I also did. did very smart stuff. Presidents, presidents. I, yeah. I interviewed a truck driver six four. In size 15 high heel shoes. <laughs> so, yeah. so, Do you remember uh, the 1992 election? Phil Donahue had, when they were all that was left, Jerry Brown and Bill Clinton in a real, you know, a real debate. A real debate. No moderator. You, no moderator. Phil Donahue yeah. gave his show to those guys to have a debate in front of his studio audience. It's another one. Could you imagine Steve Wilkos doing <clears throat> that? I mean, could you imagine? Could you imagine Mitt Romney and Barack Obama agreeing to do that now? That's no, but you know what? I could imagine Michelle Bachman, Rick Santorum, and uh, you know, Rand Paul going on the Steve Wilco show. And doing that. <laughs> but again, it's uh, over time. And we have degeneration, and that's what that is. Phil Donahue, thank you so much for being here. This is truly a pleasure and an pleasure. honor for us. Don't stop now. No, no. We'll keep going. All right. All right, we'll take a quick break. HireAHero.org presents PMS, the Pugs Moran Show, here on DeepLMOnAir.com. Touch the ground.